Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to talk about First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Now, First and Second Timothy and Titus are considered the pastorals. They're called the pastorals because these are letters that are written to individuals that are being leaders over churches, and there's advice as to how to pastor or to shepherd the sheep, how to be a, a bishop or an overseer, how to guide the saints, how to take care of the flock. And so these three letters, Timothy, Timothy, and Titus, are in the context of helping leaders to run the church. And in scholarship, many scholars look at these as non-authentic Pauline epistles because of the historical context. In the second century, so after 100 Common Era or 100 AD, there was a lot of strife or struggles in the early Christian church. There were many different Christianities, and there were letters written by church leaders in the second century encouraging the people to listen to their bishops. And because of this, they look at this as a second century production written in the name of Paul. And in scholarship, this is called pseudepigraphy. Another reason why these are not considered authentic Pauline epistles is because the author in them, or at least in part of them, uses the term faith or pistis differently than Paul used it in what's considered the genuine Pauline epistles. The term faith was of supreme importance to Paul. In books like Romans and Galatians, where everyone is agreeing, hey, Paul wrote these, the term faith is referring to trust, trusting in the person of Jesus, trusting in Jesus to bring about my salvation through his death and resurrection. In other words, faith, as Paul is using it in those epistles, describes a relationship with Christ. Faith is trust in Christ. But in the pastorals, the term faith is used in the sense of keeping the faith or defending the doctrine or the church. If you've ever heard anybody say, hey, stay true to the faith, we should be true to the faith. It's kind of used that way. If you go to Titus 1.13, this is how it reads. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. This is one of the reasons why some scholars think that perhaps Timothy, Timothy, and Titus were textualized in the second century to deal with the problems of factionalization in the Christian church, to try to help them come together and to follow the bishops. Now, I don't know if Paul wrote these. I don't know if this is a second century issue, but I wanted to at least acknowledge it. Part of this podcast is to acknowledge those arguments, but also to say, okay, but are there counter arguments? Are there other reasons why this could be a genuine Pauline epistle? Another reason why these are not considered authentic Pauline epistles was the idea that bishops arose in the second century. And so because of this, they say, well, the pastorals weren't written by Paul. But if you remember, one of the genuine Pauline epistles is Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And in the very first verse, Paul's talking about the bishops and the deacons. So I just want to say, yes, I'm acknowledging scholarship. I'm acknowledging, yes, faith is used differently. The term pistis or faith is used differently in the pastorals. But to say that bishops didn't exist in the first century, to be dogmatic and be so definitive as to make that statement, I don't know if anybody really can because none of us were there. We're really swimming in in the realm of the unknown. In scholarship, what we do is we do our best to find approximations, and one of the things scholars are really good at is arguing. They're really good at seeing differences and finding different opinions and staking out claims. And so what I just wanted to make sure that we covered was that that argument exists, but at the same time, there is a counter-argument. And my take on it, Mike, is whether Paul wrote them or not, whoever did write these letters to the bishops clearly has authority. And the message that's being delivered is in harmony with the message that the Lord has delivered to other church leaders. 
there's a lot of similarity between what's being said to Timothy as a bishop and what was said to Joshua as he took over for Moses, or even in the latter days. Whoever wrote them has authority and is being inspired to write the Lord's message to his leaders. Yeah. So obviously the book's called First Timothy. So we know that Paul's writing to an individual named Timothy. And who was he? He was Paul's dear friend, a younger colleague. Timothy traveled alongside Paul in many of his journeys. According to Acts 16, Timothy was from a town called Lystra, a town in the Roman province of Galatia in South Central Asia Minor. It is believed that Paul first encountered Timothy during his initial missionary journey, which was around AD 46. This encounter resulted in Timothy, along with his mother and his grandmother, coming into Christianity. During Paul's later visit to the area around 49 AD, local believers recommended to Paul that Timothy go with him on his travels as Paul journeyed as a missionary. This marks the beginning of a bond between Paul and Timothy that is characterized by his deep concern for Timothy, as we read in places like Philippians 2, 19 through 24. And because of Timothy's mixed lineage, his mother was Jewish and his father was a pagan, Paul decided that in order to maintain good relations with the Jews that are scattered around, Paul had Timothy circumcised. Timothy is going to share Paul's perspective on a lot of issues. He was entrusted with many assignments, including running the church in Thessalonica around 50 AD and Philippi. He collaborated with Paul in writing some of his letters, like 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 2nd Corinthians and Colossians and others. And in this letter, 1st Timothy, Timothy is given the challenging task of taking care of the church in Ephesus. So with that background on Timothy, what are the big issues in this letter? And I would say that there's a few of them. One of them is false teachings. Bryce and I are going to talk about false teachings that are kind of going on in Ephesus that Timothy is being told to address. There's some stuff in this letter on the role of women, and I'm just going to say it. This is going to be difficult stuff. It's Paul's culture, and I think if we try to translate it into ours, it could be kind of a challenge. There's some stuff in here on leadership qualifications, which I think is uh, excellent advice. And then there's some really pointed advice against materialistic pursuits. You see, Ephesus had a lot of wealth. And because of it, I think Paul saw that. I think he saw because he visited all these different churches. It'd be like today if you were a modern traveler and you went to churches in parts of the world where there was perhaps less wealth and less opportunity, you would come back from your journeys and you would relate to people oh, you have it so good. You don't even know how good you have it. And so because of this, I think Paul is writing some specific counsel to the saints in Ephesus in this letter, uh, warning them of the materialistic pursuits. You see, Ephesus was in a strategic location. It was in the western coast of Asia Minor, in what today is known as modern-day Turkey near the Aegean, and it had a harbor Uh, This harbor was well-developed, there was a lot of trade, and also there was the temple to Artemis there, one of the seven wonders of the world. And so because of this, it brought a lot of pilgrims and a lot of wealth. There were artisans there and skilled craftsmen that worked in the temple or around the temple that were able to create sculpture and pottery and metalwork and lots of wealth running in and out and through Ephesus. It was also during the Roman period, uh, the capital of the Roman province of Asia. So because of these factors, Ephesus was the nexus of an incredible amount of wealth. So Paul in these letters to Timothy is going to counsel the saints against making materialistic a pursuit like the end all and be all. I'll, I'll never forget the story of one of my friends who came back from his mission. And when he came home, he had no suitcases. And his mom said to him, where's your stuff? And Bryce, what do you think he did with his stuff? I gave it to the people who needed it more than I did, mom. Yeah. My parents said the same thing to me. And his mom took him to a store to buy some clothes because he didn't have any, he, he had nothing. He gave all his clothes away to the saints where he served his mission. And his mom picked up a pair of jeans and said, try these on. And he looked at the price tag and he started to cry. 
And his mom said, why are you crying? And he said, this could feed the family that I taught for a month, this pair of jeans. And he wept. And I think that kind of spirit is permeating through these letters as Paul's writing to Timothy, hey, what's important? What really matters? So my take on these pastorals, my take on Timothy and Titus is let's make another list of the Lord's instructions to the shepherds of the Lord's sheep. Whether you're a bishop, a stake president, whether you're a parent, whether you are you oversee young men, young women, or primary kids, whatever your role, you probably shepherd some of the Lord's sheep. And let's make a list of how to shepherd. Now, I'm going to kind of go through this sequentially, which isn't necessarily what I would do if I were making a list of importance as taught in other places of the Scripture. So let's just tackle it from the beginning to the end. Number one, chapter one of Timothy, you need to make sure that the sheep are fed what they most need. You are the steward of the food they eat, the doctrine they consume. So Paul tells Timothy in verse 3 of chapter 1, teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Make sure the food the sheep eat is nourishing for them. Don't teach things that lack substance. I love that idea of fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. Your job is not necessarily to raise the questions. Your job is to answer the questions their souls are raising. Give them food to eat. Verse 6, speaking of what needs to not happen, he says, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain janglings. And there's the contrast. Are you teaching and are your sheep eating godly edifying truths or vain janglings? For example, in Moroni chapter 6, where Moroni is reporting how the church functioned, we really don't get a look in the Book of Mormon into the church itself. We get to see how to live the gospel, but we don't see the church functioning very much in the Book of Mormon. So Moroni seems to kind of say, here's how the church functioned, and here's how their leaders did it. And so he points out to say that after they were baptized, their names were taken. Now I'm reading verse 4 of chapter 6 of Moroni. Their names were taken that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God, to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watching unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and the finisher of their faith. They were nourished. That's one of the most important things that parents do in their home and that church leaders do in their callings, is they nourish. I want to share a quotation from Boyd K. Packer back in 1982. Then Elder Packer said, In the mountains surrounding the Salt Lake Valley, there is still very deep snow. The animals, especially the deer, have suffered because of it. They have moved from the foothills to the orchards and gardens, trying to find enough nourishment to survive. President Hinckley, who lives quite near to here, has had them in his garden during the winter. For many years, game wardens bought alfalfa hay and established feed yards in the foothills. The deer came in great numbers to eat the green leafy hay. They thought they were doing all they needed to do for them. But if the winter wore on and spring was late, the deer died in great numbers. They died of starvation with their bellies full of hay. This because nutrients essential to sustain life through a long period of stress were missing from their diet. It can be like that with the flocks for whom we are the shepherds. Other stake presidents have thought they were doing all that was needed for their sheep, only to find that some have been fed but not nourished. 
like the deer with their stomachs full of hay, in times of prolonged individual stress, they do not survive spiritually. Buildings and budgets and reports and programs and procedures are very important, but by themselves they do not carry that essential spiritual nourishment and will not accomplish what the Lord has given us to do. They are only tools. The means to an end, not ends in themselves. End quote. In other words, Elder Packer was saying, make sure that the sheep over whom you preside are nourished. One more from President Spencer W. Kimball. I fear that all too often, many of our members come to church, sit through a class or meeting, and then they then return home having been largely uninspired. It is especially unfortunate when this happens at a time when they may be entering a period of stress, temptation, or crisis. We all need to be touched and nourished by the Spirit, and effective teaching is one of the most important ways this can happen. We often do vigorous enlistment work to get members to come to church, but then do not adequately watch over what they receive when they do come. End of quote. Make sure, shepherds, that you are overseeing their nourishment, that they are being fed. Number two on my list is couched in between those two verses. It's almost missed if we don't pull it out separately. It's given in the context of making sure that we teach correct doctrine. But verse five of chapter one is a whole sermon for any shepherd. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned. In other words, if the shepherds don't love their sheep, it really matters little what else they do. The essence of leadership in the church is to love those you lead. And I love how he words it here. Charity out of a pure heart. It's not faked. It's not the person who gets a calling and now all of a sudden shows an interest in someone they've never cared about. And now I have to love you. It's my calling. Youth are very quick to notice when their church leaders don't naturally love them, when they have to love them, because all of a sudden they got called into a position that expects me to love you. And they're kind of faking it. They don't genuinely love. I think leadership demands that we kneel down and beg Heavenly Father to see our sheep the way He sees the sheep. Next, I want to jump in chapter 1 to verse 15. So we've got love and teach the doctrine, but I think it's important that leaders of the church not let their leadership go to their head. In Doctrine and Covenants section 121, where he's talking about many are called but few are chosen, and what are the reasons we're not chosen? Joseph writes in verse 37, that they may be conferred upon us, meaning the rights of the priesthood, it is true. But when we undertake to, and then he gives us this list, and I think the idea here is don't let your position as a leader in the church cause you to, number one, cover your sins. Number two, gratify our pride or our vain ambition. And in, in other words, don't let your position of leadership cause you to think that you're better. And so an element of good leadership is a wonderful dose of humility. And I love how Paul presents his in verses 12 through 15. Back in Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, He's clearly talking about himself in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. And I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ. And then he says this beautiful phrase in verse 15, this is a faithful saying, 
and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul, an apostle, never forgot that he deeply needed Christ and that he was imperfect and that he needed that atoning sacrifice to overcome his imperfections. And I think the wording here to Timothy is simply, be humble. Remember that you need Jesus just as much as they do. The Lord said early in our dispensation, in Doctrine and Covenants section 12, Behold, I speak unto you, and also to those who have desires to bring forth and establish this work. Now listen to this definitive statement from the Lord in our day. No one can assist in this work except he shall be humble and full of love, having faith, hope, and charity, being temperate in all things. And I think every one of us should say, no matter what our position, like Paul an apostle said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now, because Bryce is covering these things sequentially, this advice to, to leaders in the church, before we leave chapter one and before we go to chapter three, where his list will continue, I want to just pause here and talk about some of the things going on at the end of chapter one. Notice in the end of chapter one, we read this statement in verse 18. This charge I commit unto you, Timothy according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now in 2 Timothy two seventeen, we read, that there's some individuals that are doing vain babblings and they're profaning the truth. And in verse 17, Paul writes, and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, we don't know who these individuals are, but there seems to be this idea that Paul is cutting them off from the church Early Jewish sources, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, attest to a range of levels of excommunication. The the term excommunication, as it's used in history, kind of has this idea of removing someone from table fellowship or table communion. Remember, the Jews were very tight in the first century as to who they would eat with. And so if you have communion or fellowship with a group, then to be excommunicated means you no longer have that table fellowship. And so there were levels of this in in early Jewish sources. The full level was complete and total exclusion from the community. This would be for extended periods or perhaps even permanent if the change didn't happen that was required. So by handling these blasphemers and, quote, delivering them over to Satan, Paul is simply acknowledging the sphere that they had already chosen to enter. These individuals, and I'm just going to call it Hymenaeus here, he's basically in opposition to Paul. And so Paul is saying, I'm going to pull them away from the church. But notice his purpose. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look what his purpose is. It's not just random. His purpose in verse 20 is, so that they learn not to blaspheme. So in this context... Hymenaeus and probably Philetus had been officially cut off, but they still, at least according to this letter, seem to have retained a pervasive influence among the church there in Ephesus. They probably had quite the following. You see, then as it is today, it was easy for almost any speaker to get a hearing. But because there were few people who were skilled in the scriptures and there were few people who could read them, What we have is we have an individual who's skilled at reading, he's skilled at rhetoric, and he is skilled in the scriptures. It put him in a powerful position, and for this reason, I think Paul had to make this decision. Hey, we have to remove him from the church. I really appreciate these words by President Hinckley. He said this, 
Every individual in the church is free to think as he pleases, but when an individual speaks openly and actively and takes measures to enlist others in opposition to the church and its programs, then we feel that there is cause for action. And I think that's the real issue. I think all of us, no matter who we are, believe things that maybe aren't perfect, or we have ideas that maybe aren't totally in line with the gospel program, but we're still striving. But when we come out in opposition to people like Paul, in this case, then there's going to be issues. Now, when we go to chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, we have to acknowledge some of the passages here that are kind of difficult. So let's go to verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Now, first, I just want to acknowledge these are difficult passages. Second, a lot of scholars that tackle this go right to the authorship debate. Well, Paul didn't write it, so it really doesn't matter. We really don't need to take 1 Timothy serious. Another way to look at this is this is culture. This is the culture of either the first or second century of Paul or whoever wrote the text. All of those are valid arguments. But if we focus on the first part as Paul's discussing women— Notice what he's saying. He's talking about women having the ability to learn and engage with religious topics in his day, which did mark a significant departure from the way the Pharisees did things. This represented a positive cultural advancement, allowing women to participate actively in religious education. But the part in here where it says, let women learn in silence with all subjection, seems pretty harsh. And it also seems to be reminiscent of the pharisaical tradition that restricted women from speaking in any public setting. Christian women, on the other hand, were encouraged to fully participate in religious worship. They were encouraged to offer their opinions and to ask questions. And it was a shift from the norms of Paul's day. It is important to also note, and I'm just calling this out because I can't help myself. I read the Bible and my brain starts to just hurt because I go... But what about these other verses? So I'm just going to call this out that all these verses in in chapter 2 about women seem to contradict other statements that Paul made where he encouraged women to pray. That's actually in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, talking about women praying. He encouraged women to prophesy and teach. You can read about that in Titus 2 verses 3 and 4. Paul also emphasized the unity and interdependence of all members in the body of Christ. That's in Galatians. Throughout his letters, Paul reiterated the importance of everyone's contribution. He he does it over and over again. He does it in Romans 16, 1 and 2. He does it in Philippians 4, 2 and 3. All this stuff's in the show notes. I put it all in there because as I'm writing this stuff out furiously, I see all the contradictions. We have verses like 1 Timothy 2, but then we have other verses in Paul's other letters. And so I'm just trying to emphasize this important idea that Scripture is messy. I'm also open to the idea that maybe Paul didn't write these verses. I'm also open to the idea of there's stuff I don't know. There's stuff I don't understand. But the one thing I do understand in my life, in my experience, as I've counseled with my wife, the decisions that we have made as we've sat and counseled together in my life are some of the sweetest experiences of my life. And so that, to me, is my testimony, regardless of some of the difficulties of these verses. Whatever we read about dispensations in the past that may have been cultural, we need to understand that our dispensation stands in a very different position. When President Nelson was president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he gave a landmark address called A Plea to My Sisters. 
he talks about faithful women, and then he says this, this has been true in every gospel dispensation since the days of Adam and Eve, meaning men and women standing side by side with each other. And then President Nelson adds this, yet the women of this dispensation are distinct from the women of any other because this dispensation is distinct from any other. This distinction brings both privileges and responsibilities. Then he quotes President Kimball. 36 years ago in 1979, President Spencer W. Kimball made a profound prophecy upon the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's church. So now we have, at that moment, the current president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles quoting a previous president of the church. Quote, Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to a degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives, and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. Then President Nelson, at the end of his talk, gives this plea. Attacks against the church, its doctrine, our way of life are going to increase. Because of this, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ and who will use that understanding to teach and help raise a sin-resistant generation. We need women who can detect deception in all its forms. We need women who know how to access the power that God makes available to covenant keepers and who express their belief with confidence and charity. We need women who have the courage and vision of our mother Eve. And then he says, So today I plead with my sisters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to step forward. Take your rightful and needed place in your home, in your community, and in the kingdom of God more than you ever have before. I plead with you to fulfill President Kimball's prophecy, and I promise you in the name of Jesus Christ that as you do so, the Holy Ghost will magnify your influence in an unprecedented way. I think if I was teaching a class, I would probably read that. I think that is going to have a lot more power in the classroom than maybe getting into some of the weeds of the arguments in chapter two, especially when we understand that in Paul's other epistles, he's saying other things that are more in line with what President Nelson is talking about. So I wanted to just acknowledge that as we move now into 1 Timothy chapter three, and now we're going to talk about Paul's advice to Timothy on how to choose bishops. Remember, Ephesus needs bishops at this time. And I'm going to use that as an opportunity to get back to our list, and not just how to be a good bishop, but how to be a shepherd. And I love the list he gives in verses 2 through 7 of the qualities of a good bishop. But I want to focus on verse 5, because the Lord gave strong emphasis to verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his house, and I think the word rule is probably needs to be clarified. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church? By the way, Bryce, you mentioned the word rule and you said we'll talk about it. So why don't we just talk about it really quick? It's basically coming from two Greek words, pro and histami. And histami means to set up or to place or to put and pro is usually before. So to stand before, to place before. So when you're teaching a class, you are standing before the class. You're maintaining it, governing it. In essence, a father's job is kind of like a coach on a football team to make sure the player is in the right place, to make sure that things are running. They're standing before the team. Uh, they're motivating the team at halftime. What should a father be doing? He should be standing before. Uh, think about a father's role, to preside, to protect, and to provide. 
I really like that. I think rule does sound a little bit harsh, especially in historically as people have ruled with an iron fist. Yeah, I think sometimes we read it that way. But I think really, what does it mean to provide, preside, protect? Provost Amy, stand before. So among all the wonderful things that our wonderful bishops do, they need to remember their own house. Now, I'm going to take you to Doctrine and Covenants section 93 and let you watch the Lord do this with the first presidency. The first presidency at the time was Joseph Smith was president, Sidney Rigdon was the first counselor, and Frederick G. Williams was the second counselor. So in section 93, watch the Lord rebuke all three of them. Verse 41 is his rebuke of Frederick G. Williams. His issue was what was happening at home. He says in verse 42, You have not taught your children light and truth according to the commandments, and that wicked one hath power as yet over you, and this is the cause of your affliction. So he says in verse 43, Set in order your own house. For there are many things there that are not right in your house. Verse 44 is Sidney Rigdon, the first counselor in the first presidency. And he is told that in some things he hath not kept the commandments concerning his children. Therefore, first set in order thy house. Why the word first? Prophets, seers, and revelators have repeatedly taught that no other success can compensate for failure in the home. So first set in order thy house. So let's get to Joseph Smith's rebuke. In verse 47 of section 93, Now verily I say unto Joseph Smith, Jr., you have not kept the commandments and must needs stand rebuke before the Lord. Your family must needs repent and forsake some things and give more earnest heed. And then he says in verse 49, What I say unto one, I say unto all. That was the Lord waving his arms and saying, what I just did with the first presidency, I'm intending all of you. Did you hear the message? And then as one more example, verse 50 is one of the bishops of the church, Newell K. Whitney. He says in verse 50, hath need to be chastened and set in order his family and see that they are more diligent and concerned at home. How we do at home brings power to what we do in the kingdom. So I would add that to my list. I think that's the, the most significant thing for me that comes out of chapter 3. He mentions the same thing when he's talking about the qualities of deacons. In verse 12, speaking to deacons, he mentions that they're married and that they rule their children. Again, back to Mike's definition, they rule their children and their own houses well. Notice that both the bishops and the deacons were taught that concept about take care of things at home. Now, I want to just note that in this chapter, it talks about both bishops and deacons being married. It's important for Latter-day Saint readers. I I think some of us may think this is out of place. I thought deacons were 12-year-olds or 11-year-olds, as the case may be. Well, that's not necessarily how it was in Paul's day. And even in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, deacons were not always young men. There was actually a shift in the history of the church where deacons were ordained and assigned duties when they were younger, and it basically occurred in six stages in history in the church. And if you want to know more about this, go to the show notes, and we give you a link by William Hartley. He wrote a great paper called From Men to Boys, LDS Aaronic Priesthood Offices. But just note that historically, at least in the early church, deacons were servants, and bishops were the episcopoi. They were those that were the overseers. They looked over the church, and the deacons served the church. And in the context of this letter, both groups were married men. Notice verse 6. It says that they were not a novice. They weren't newbies. Uh, the Greek, me neophuton, they were not newly planted. Uh, that's where we get the term neophyte. These were people that had experience. Now, in the church today, how we have deacons at a young age, I actually like that because what does it do? It puts the youth in a position to gain experience. And so, if you think about how young men and young women serve missions, 
What a blessing that is to the church. As they have that experience, it increases their faith, and then they bring that home that skill set of the ability to preach the gospel and to relate to people and to talk about the gospel in relatable ways that aren't strange, but are that are in everyday conversation, and they're able to build their communities. I think the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a model in Christianity of how to live the faith in the real world and to preach Christ in a world of diverse opinions and do it in a way that can bring people together and build faith. Now, before we leave that one about taking care of what's happening at home, I'm going to jump out of sequence just to add one. In chapter 5, speaking of kind of widows and taking care of them, he adds this beautiful little verse that I think needs to be added to this concept. He says in verse 8 of chapter 5, "...but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith." and is worse than an infidel. I think sometimes we see people so gung-ho about their church callings that they actually provide better spiritual nutrients for people who aren't their children in the church than for our own children. We allow our time to pull us away from our children, and we don't take care of our those of our own house. Well, to provide not for your own house is to deny the faith and to be an infidel, be worse than an infidel. So let's add that to the list. Now, continuing on, we're going to jump to chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I, I love the prophecy about things are going to get hard and people are going to fall away. So what do you do? What do you as a leader do when people give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies? and sear their conscience with a hot iron. Those were the first three verses of chapter 4. Here's what shepherds do when their sheep are being attacked at so many levels. Verse 12, be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. That's the antidote. Be an example of the believers. I love what Elder Holland taught in 2003 in his conference talk called A Prayer for the Children. Let me just quote from Elder Holland. He said, As parents, we can hold life together the way it is always held together, with love and faith passed on to the next generation one child at a time. In offering such a prayer for the young, may I address a rather specific aspect of their safety. In this, I speak carefully and lovingly to any of the adults of the church, parents or otherwise, who may be given to cynicism or skepticism, who in matters of whole-souled devotion always seem to hang back a little, who at the church's doctrinal campsite always like to pitch their tents out on the periphery of religious faith. To all such, whom we do love and wish were more comfortable camping near us, I say, please be aware that the full price to be paid for such a stance does not always come due in your lifetime. No, sadly, some elements of this can be a kind of a profligate national debt with payments coming out of your children's and grandchildren's pockets in far more expensive ways than you ever intended it to be. In this church, there is an enormous amount of room and scriptural commandment for studying and learning, for comparing and considering, for discussion and awaiting further revelation. We all learn line upon line, precept upon precept, with the goal being authentic religious faith informing genuine Christ-like living. In this, there is no place for coercion or manipulation, no place for intimidation or hypocrisy. But no child in this church should be left with uncertainty about his or her parents' devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, the restoration of his church, and the reality of living prophets and apostles. I'm going to skip forward. Parents simply cannot flirt with skepticism or cynicism, then be surprised when their children expand that flirtation into full-blown romance. 
If in matters of faith and belief, children are at risk of being swept downstream by this intellectual current or that cultural rapid, we as their parents must be more certain than ever to hold to anchored, unmistakable moorings, clearly recognizable to those of our own household, end quote. And so be an example of the believers. Be an example in word and in conversation. It's okay to have questions, but show your children a root of faith. Be like the father whose child had an evil spirit, and he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe. I'm working on the things I don't believe. But here's my root. Here's my foundation. I am a believer who's working on these things to see where they fit in the kingdom. I do have questions, and I think it's okay for children to know that I have questions, but I want my children to see an example of a believer, that I'm not throwing out what I know is true because there's a couple questions I haven't yet settled. One time, Dallin H. Oaks was asked a question that the gospel doesn't really clarify, and he could have speculated. And he could have said, I don't, I don't know, and I don't understand. Instead, he said to his child, I don't know, but here's what I do know. And then he bore a powerful testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith and the restoration. There's lots of counsel in the fifth chapter of First Timothy about widows and taking care of them. And it was important, and it was actually part of custom and law to take care of widows in your family. So why is this council in here? Well, there must have been some need in Ephesus at this time where there were widows in the church. I also see perhaps that there were widows who joined the Christian faith because of the way that they discussed taking care of everyone, that everyone matters. The worth of souls is great. I think that's perhaps another reason why there were widows in Ephesus, because uh, Christianity shared that message. Notice verse 1 of chapter 5, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. There seem to be also, we're back to this idea of disunity, that the author of 1 Timothy is emphasizing order, that we need to have bishops and that we need to listen to the elders and their counsel. Now, at the end of 1 Timothy 5, there's a verse that I think might draw a lot of attention in a Latter-day Saint audience, and that's verse 23. Paul writes, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Paul talks a little bit about wine in these letters. He talks about it here in 523. He talks about it also in 1 Timothy 3 verse 8, using wine. Now, it makes sense that they would put a little bit of wine in their water because it would disinfect the things that were in the water. That was pretty much a cultural thing. Paul is acknowledging this. Now, in his letters, he's going to say things like, hey, don't be over excessive in your use of alcohol or your use of wine. Here, he's encouraging Timothy to take some for your stomach's sake. But as Latter-day Saints, we are following section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is the word of wisdom, that we as followers of Christ are not to drink any alcohol whatsoever. First Timothy 6, Paul gives some advice to those that are servants. He's telling the, the slaves there in Ephesus to continue under the yoke of their masters. That's a challenging bit of advice. And there were a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire, perhaps as many as a third, and it depending on where you were and the wealth of the household, uh, but there were servants, and there were all kinds of levels. Those servants that worked in the house with the children were kind of a higher status than those that were in the field. And this is a challenge because what we want, especially moderns, is we want Paul to basically throw slavery out the window and say, hey, slavery is so bad. And we have some of that in Galatians where he says, hey, we're all brothers in Christ. There's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no male, there's no female. We are all brothers and sisters. And while I agree with that, Paul's not always talking like that. And here he's actually exhorting the servants or challenging them to be obedient to their masters. It's a challenge. 
one of my favorite scholars that talks about the complexity of this issue is Peter Enns. And Peter Enns discusses slavery and how it has been viewed in the Bible and in Christian tradition when he writes this. He says, as for slavery, Paul could have been clearer. He never actually argues for it, but he does assume its legitimacy, as does the Old Testament. Paul never once calls the institution of slavery itself into question, and he certainly never abolishes it. That being said, Peter Enns writes, major props to Paul for pushing the social boundaries of his day. For example, when he claims that slaves are equal to freed persons in God's eyes, that's Galatians 3.28, which did not accord with the thinking of the ancient Israelites. In a society based on honor and shame, where the social pecking order was sacred, claiming that slaves and free persons were the same in God's eyes would be like telling white supremacists that they are no better in God's eyes than people of color. So Paul is pushing the boundaries, but the church has had a far from flawless track record when it comes to slavery. There are instances that are horrid and shameful throughout the history of Christianity, not the least of which is the saga of buying and selling Africans, to the glory of God, of course. And yes, as hard as it is to believe, even today I have heard of Christians making atrocious arguments from their rule book Bible for why slavery of non-white humans is part of God's design. Having said that, if you asked your average Joe and Jane on the street what Christians think about slavery— they'd probably say that Christians denounce slavery as immoral. Generally speaking, in other words, the church is known for having accepted Paul's boundary-pushing trajectory and pushing it even farther. Freedom and equality eventually won out as the norm over passages like, hey, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, Ephesians 6, 5, a compliant go-to passage of 19th century slave owners. Actually, slavery is a really good example for us to look at here. That issue caused a real crisis for Christians in the 19th century who thought that the Bible had the clear answer. The problem is that Northern abolitionists and Southern anti-abolitionists made their case by pointing to the same Bible. The thing is, when the Bible is viewed as a once-for-all rule book, the anti-abolitionists had a slam-dunk case because you have passages from both parts of the Bible that assume the institution of slavery. The abolitionists had to argue differently on the basis of the Bible's trajectory towards justice and equality. That type of argument is a wisdom argument, tied not to the words on the page, but to discerning where the Spirit seems to be leading. I am glad to say that the wisdom way of handling slavery won the day, at least in theory. The racism that lay beneath it, tragically, is still with us. But my point is that the way of addressing human slavery had to go beyond the Bible. It had to take seriously the moment and read it well. The Bible couldn't be counted on to settle a pressing moral issue of the day, that of slavery. That should have been a wake-up call for everyone that knowing what to do cannot be left to finding a Bible verse. Notice what Peter Enns just said there. This is an evangelical Christian who's basically saying, We've got to have more than the Bible to know what to do. Think about what he just said. And then he continues. The Bible isn't set up for that sort of thing. The Bible is ambiguous enough for us to find there what we already believe. The answer to this issue would need to be found elsewhere in the realm of wisdom, not Bible verses. That's from Peter N's How the Bible Actually Works. Why is that important? I think one of the things he's calling out here is that the same Bible was used by Southern slave owners and Northern abolitionists to make their point, and you can find verses that back up both sides of that question. And the last thing he mentions here is that the realm of wisdom is what is going to answer some of these questions. Joseph Smith put it this way. Speaking of James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Remember what Peter Enns just said about wisdom. Joseph said, I reflected on it again and again, James 1, 5, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. For the teachers of religion of the different sects understood the same passages of scripture so differently 
as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. You see, the Bible is not the final answer. It's God. It's the wisdom of God. And that is the point that Peter ends is trying to make. He is calling this out, that in the Bible, you can find a passage on both sides of the argument. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we've got to have wisdom to navigate these waters. And so with that, we are now going to go into a warning about the love of money. He says in verse 10 that the love of money is the root of all evil. And I've heard it quoted often that people say that money is the root of all evil. And I always like to say, no, no, it's not money that's the root of all evil. Rather, it's the love of money. And so Paul is challenging the saints in Ephesus, which was once again a very wealthy city, to be content with the things of this life. He says in verse 8, to have food and raiment, we should be content with that. And then he says in verse 9, they that be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Why? Why do they fall into a temptation? Because they have a love of money. And so what must we do? Verse 11, we must flee these things. We must not put our trust in money. Our trust in money or our love of money is a big problem that he sees in Ephesus. And I think it's an easy thing to fall into. It's really easy to get into this position where we think that the money means for some reason that we're better than someone else, or that the money is something that we should trust in. And so he says this in verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, rather in the living God. That is an important message in Timothy. Now, this is challenging, but he also says this in verse 16, speaking of God, he says, whom no man has seen nor can see. And in the Joseph Smith translation, that is changed. Now, I just want to acknowledge this. It does say in 1 Timothy 6, 16, that no man has seen God nor can see God. And yet, what do we have in Paul's writings? He said, I've seen seen God. Like, he's clearly seen him. We have John in the book of Revelation who says, I've seen him. We have Joseph Smith who says, I've seen him. We have the 12 apostles who've seen the resurrected Jesus. They've eaten with him. And so this, once again, like some of the other passages in 1 Timothy, can be quite challenging. If you're interested, there's more stuff in the show notes. We have many pages in the show notes covering the pastorals, more than we have time to talk about here. But just know we have these inconsistencies or messiness in the Bible. And so now we're going to shift into 2 Timothy. And so the next thing I would add on our list is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. So sheep need to see a courageous shepherd, a bold shepherd. A shepherd that says, look, I don't have all the answers, but this is what I know. Sheep need to see that the shepherd looks to the future with encouragement, that life is good. Boy, how I loved President Hinckley's optimism. Every time he spoke, we were just so optimistic of the future. We as church leaders and as parents need to do the same thing. We need to give our children hope that their lives are going to be rich and wonderful and that God is going to do marvelous things. President Nelson has repeatedly said that the Savior's greatest miracles are ahead of us, not behind us. So move forward with faith and hope and not having a spirit of fear. Look at verse 15. For my reading of 2 Timothy 1 verse 15, things are worse than when Paul wrote 1 Timothy. He says in verse 15, all they which are in Asia are turned away from me. And then he adds some of the names of the individuals that are rallying against him. And so, and, and I don't know if it was everyone that is turned away, but Paul clearly sees the apostasy happening in real time in his life. And he sees all these different people opposing him, and yet he has this optimistic attitude. 
Imagine the difficulties that he faced. He may have even been in prison at this time. And so I think that's wise counsel. So now we get to kind of a landmark chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, a prophecy and then a solution. The prophecy is, know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be, and then this very, very long list, lovers of own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemy, verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Boy, that is true in our day. I'm sure it was true in Paul's day. This is the challenge. In other words, this is the environment the sheep I oversee are living in. This is the world they deal with. When my children go off to school, these are the challenges they face. When they walk out into the world, these are the wolves that my sheep have to deal with. So what do I do as their father? What do I do as a church leader? How do I help the sheep prepare for those challenges? Now, this is probably the one I would shift towards the top of the list if we were going in order of importance. But it's now at the bottom of our list because we went sequentially. So don't let that diminish its importance here. The answer in verse 14 and 15, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, one of the single most important things that leaders in his church can do, or shepherds, is to give themselves to a study of his words, to treasure up his words, as he has said. If we will study the scriptures, it will open up helps and powers in ways we can't even conceive. I like what he says in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The scriptures are an antidote to the problems in the first part of chapter 3. And really, the scriptures are an antidote to so many of the problems in chapter 2. And yet, what scriptures did Paul have? It was the Old Testament. The New Testament had not even been written yet. And many people believe that Paul didn't even know that his letters would be scripture in our day. He was just writing letters of counsel to help the church. And I love what Joseph Smith adds to verse 16. Instead of writing that all Scripture is given by inspiration, we read, and all Scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable. I think the distinction is important. I think what Joseph Smith is trying to point our minds to is this idea that it's the inspiration of God, the wellspring, the source of the water. If I'm going to drink the water, I want to go to the source. I don't want to go down river where it's been muddied. And as we've illustrated in this podcast, there are many places in the text where there is some messiness. And so the wellspring or the source of the water is God. What is the purpose of Scripture? To get us to a position where we can be connected to the divine. If we can talk to Heavenly Father and get His inspiration, that will be a great benefit to us. And so I like that. It's a very subtle distinction, but in the JST of verse 16, once again, it reads, and all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable. Therefore, can you see the importance of giving ourselves to the word of God as shepherds? I would encourage all of you to take some time this week and find one of the most powerful resources you'll ever read. When President Ezra Taft Benson was very new in his position as president of the church, as he began his ministry, in April of 1986, he gathered the leaders of the church, the general authorities, and before conference began, he delivered what is perhaps one of the greatest talks on church leadership you'll ever find. They included it with the general conference talks in the May Enzyme 1986. 
towards the back, you will find his address called The Power of the Word. It is by far one of the most influential things I've ever read. President Benson begins by quoting Lehi and Paul and the challenges of our day. He quotes what I just read about in the latter days, men would be in all this list. And then he quotes his advice to Timothy that you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise. Now this from Ezra Taft Benson. My dear brethren, this is an answer to the great challenge of our time. The Word of God as found in the Scriptures, in the words of living prophets, and in personal revelation— has the power to fortify the saints and arm them with the Spirit so they can resist evil, hold fast to the good, and find joy in this life. Now to you priesthood leaders we say, look to the prophetic counsel of Lehi and Paul and others like them. In that counsel you will find the solution to the challenges you face in keeping your flock safe from the ravaging wolves that surround them. We know that you too have great anxiety for the members of your wards and stakes and expend great time and effort in their behalf. There is much that we ask of you who have been chosen for leadership. We place many loads upon your shoulders. You are asked to run the programs of the church, interview and counsel with the members, see that the financial affairs of the stakes and wards are properly handled, manage welfare projects, build buildings, and engage in a host of other time-consuming activities. While none of those activities can be ignored and laid aside, they are not the most important thing you can do for those you serve. The most, I'm skipping forward, you can read what he says in between. The most important things you can do as priesthood leaders is to immerse yourselves in the scriptures. Let me apply that to parents. The most important things you can do as parents is to immerse yourselves in the scriptures, search them diligently. Feast upon the words of Christ. Learn the doctrine. Master the principles that are found therein. There are few other efforts that will bring greater dividends to your calling. There are few other ways to gain greater inspiration as you serve. Now listen. But that alone, as valuable as it is, is not enough. You must also bend your efforts and your activities to stimulate meaningful Scripture study among the members of the church. Often we spend great effort in trying to increase the activity levels in our stakes. We work diligently to raise the percentage of those attending sacrament meetings. We labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the number of those marrying in the temple. All of these are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. But when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase, commitment will be strengthened, families will be fortified, personal revelation will flow. End quote. That shaped my young life. That I have known from a child the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise. And that me giving myself to the study of the Scriptures, to connecting with God through Scripture, has made me a better father, a much better father, a better husband, and a far better church leader than anything else I could have done. The secret to great leadership is to treasure up the Word in your own heart and then to do all that you can to help those you lead treasure up the Word of God in their hearts. Now that leads us to the last chapter of Second Timothy, which is kind of a repeat of some of these themes that we've seen earlier. Let me go back to the very first one in verse 2 of chapter 4. Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort 
with all long suffering and doctrine. Remember, shepherds need to teach what's true. It is not an act of love to ignore someone who needs to be corrected and to do it lovingly. Part of being a shepherd, part of being a parent, is not to be their friend at moments. Yes, there are moments where I'm going to be their friend. But part of being a parent is to take advantage of that moment and reprove, rebuke, exhort, but to do it with all long suffering and doctrine. I just think this is a beautiful description of what a shepherd does. There is behavior that needs to be corrected in a child or even maybe in a ward setting, but I'm going to teach truth and I'm going to do it lovingly and patiently. I remind you what the Lord added to that in the Doctrine and Covenants in that great section on many are called but few are chosen, and that when we do need to reprove, we do need to reprove with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, then show forth afterwards an increase of love towards him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy." I love that Boyd K. Packer said that true doctrine understood changes behavior faster than the study of behavior changes behavior. So teach truth, and truth will change behavior. The opposite of that is in verse 3 and 4. Again, watch the doctrine, because some people, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Beautiful description of those who don't want to hear God's truth. I want to hear what I believe is truth. So I'm going to go find a teacher who will tell me what I believe is true. Those are itching ears. Itching ears are when I only want to hear a selected message that I like. And I don't want to hear the fullness. I don't want to hear the things that I don't agree with. They, verse 4, shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So in our shepherding, teach truth. That's the last one on our list, number eight. One of the things we see here in 2 Timothy 4 in these verses is this idea that there were lots of different ways that people were teaching about Christ. And Elder Ballard put it this way. He said, Early Christians endured the challenges of persecution and hardship. Peter and his brethren had a difficult time holding the church together and keeping the doctrine pure. They traveled extensively and they wrote to one another about the problems they were facing, but information moved so slowly and the church and its teachings were so new that heading off false teachings before they became firmly entrenched was difficult. The New Testament indicates that the early apostles worked hard to preserve the church that Jesus had left to their care and keeping, but they knew their efforts would ultimately be in vain. I think that's one of the things that we see here. There were so many different versions of Christianity going around, especially as we turn into the second century. And the author's conclusion of 2 Timothy 4 is, verse 2, we've got to preach the word. For them, the word would have been the Hebrew Bible. For Paul, the word would have been the Hebrew Bible seen through the lens of Revelation. Remember what he says in, in Galatians. He says, I received this gospel not, for, not of man, but of by revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul reads the Hebrew Bible through the lens of Jesus. For me, when I read the Bible, I read it through the lens of the restoration. That's my lens. And that's why I'm always going to read it a little bit different than my evangelical brothers and sisters. Paul says, I read the Hebrew Bible through the lens of Jesus and Revelation, and I read the Bible through the lens of Revelation and the Restoration. The Book of Mormon is going to be my frame. And so we preach the word, we be instant in season, and we reprove and we rebuke. In other words, we call out the distinctions, the differences, but then we exhort with long suffering and doctrine. And so there were problems then, and there's problems now. How do we know how to address the problems now? I think the the easy answer is 
uh, look to the Quorum of the Twelve. The First Presidency and, and the Quorum of the Twelve are going to do the things that Second Timothy 4 is talking about. And as we heed their witness, I think that will really help to keep the doctrine pure in the Latter-day Church. Now, before we get into Titus, Paul kind of signs off here and probably dates this letter as to some time in Rome where his life is coming to an end, and he knows it. He signs off in verse 6 through 8, I am now ready to be offered, for the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What a beautiful thing to be able to say at the end. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. There's something about the confidence that comes to a life who has followed Jesus. Doesn't mean they've been perfect. Paul certainly hasn't been perfect. Neither was Enos, who came to the end of his life and knew that he would hear the voice of his Redeemer with pleasure. And his his Redeemer would say, come unto me, you blessed. Inherit the mansion I've prepared for you. There is something about striving to follow Jesus and finding in the end that peace of conscience to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I think we should all set that as a course and say, I want to get there. I want to get to the end of my life and look back and say, I certainly wasn't perfect, but I did my best to follow Jesus. I have finished my race. Now we're going to go into Titus. Who was he? We really don't know a lot about him. We know less about Titus than we do about Timothy. He's not mentioned in Acts. We don't read about him in the book of Acts. And then from Paul, we learn that Titus was a Gentile. And that we, we also learn that he was a co-worker of Paul. The event in Galatians 2 verse 1 probably dates to around 48 and 49 AD, where we read that Titus was a trusted companion throughout Paul's life. Galatians 2 1 uh, reads as follows. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, I took Titus with me also. And so we know that Titus was a Greek. In verse 3 of Galatians 2, we read that he was compelled to be circumcised. Now, this is a challenge because for a long time, for a lot of the letters, Paul's saying, hey, we're not doing this. But it seems to me as I'm reading this that Paul's having Titus do this so that he's able to reach the Jewish community, so that he's able to reach them and bring them into Christ and to teach them who Jesus is. And so Titus is a church leader that's left on the island of Crete. We read this in Titus chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ our Savior, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. I'll say this about Crete. Crete was a strategically important location, and the Roman Empire had a strong military presence there to assert control and safeguard against piracy. Remember, having the sea lanes open and avoiding piracy was one of the ways that the empire could be strong. When you have trade and it's successful and you're able to keep piracy down, you have order. And so Crete was one of those places where it had a strong military presence. And from my reading of Titus, this is a place where Paul has planted Christianity in the hopes that it will grow. And we're going to have church leaders here, and Titus is going to be the ecclesiastical leader in charge to help organize the church and grow the gospel message. And one of the things we'll see throughout all these letters, there's breadcrumbs all over the place of these messages of how to keep the church together. And so in this book, we're going to read about problems in Crete. And then because there's problems, scriptures also offer a solution. And so one of the solutions that we're going to find in Titus is that we're going to have ordained ministers who are to be in charge to help settle those things. And so there's this discussion about bishops that we'll, we'll get into. And a lot of the message that Paul sends to Titus is very similar to what he sent to Timothy. You're going to find a lot of repetition. 
For example, one of the main themes that flows throughout is the number one on our list on how to be a shepherd, and that is oversee the doctrine. Make sure that you teach correct doctrine. Notice in his list of what a bishop does, starting in verse 7 of Titus 1, Paul is giving Titus a list of, here's who you're looking for when you call bishops. These are the kind of qualities you're looking for. But at the end of verse 9, he says that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's a major theme that we saw in Timothy. You need to be able to teach sound doctrine in such a way that it exhorts and convinces, it invites them. Because, verse 10, you're going to be faced with vain talkers and deceivers. Do you see that theme, the itching ears? Vain talkers and deceivers. Because, verse 14, many of them are going to fall prey to Jewish fables. Paul's used that word a lot, both to Timothy and to Titus. Watch out for those who give heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, verse 15, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. So, verse 2, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That's a major theme. Verse 15 of chapter 2, do it with authority. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with authority. Let no man despise thee. And there's a sermon for another day, but President Nelson in his very first talk, his prophet says, we're not claiming the blessings. We're not claiming the authority of the priesthood and the power of the priesthood that belongs to all of us, whether you hold an office in the priesthood or not. All of us who have been given a task by a key holder have authority. And when we tap into that authority and speak with authority, people feel that. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And then he reminds him, I think this is that, you know, be humble, be subject to principalities and powers. And that's a gentle way for Paul to say, be subject unto me. I'm the apostle. But he does it in a very humble way saying, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceivers, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But... After that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior towards man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Follow the leaders of the church, not because they're perfect. They're not, but they have been called of God. They have been blessed and made capable of doing his work. Therefore, we should follow them. Again, back to the opposite, verse 9, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. In Titus chapter 2, there's instruction regarding household codes, verses 2 through 10. We've talked about household codes before, but just know that the way the structure worked back in Paul's day, the way they understand the order of society is different than we understand it today. Due to the Roman suspicions towards minority religions, and remember, Christianity in the first century was a minority religion, there were many in the Roman Empire who had this tendency to view other religions as suspect. And so one of the things we read here is that Christianity is adopting the household codes that were in line with the teachings of the philosophers of Paul's day. These household codes provided guidance 
to men who were the heads of households in Paul's day on how to interact with each member in the household, especially women, children, and slaves. That's what's going on in Titus chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. So the scope of these codes extended beyond household management and encompassed aspects such as the relationship with parents, the responsibilities to the state, and the obligations to the gods that they had back then. And so one of the things we see here is that this household code is part of the order of the day. And by understanding this, we're kind of, as people are coming in from outside of non-Christian circles into Christianity, uh, that they see that there's a structure. So what do we have here? We have, we have this teaching here that the women, verse 4, are to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children and to be chaste, and that the young men, verse 6, are to be sober-minded, that they're to have sound speech or healthy speech. And then we have this passage in verse 9, to exhort servants to be obedient to their masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Now that's a to me, verse 9 is a really challenging verse. We have other verses like this in the New Testament where Paul is exhorting servants to be obedient to their masters. This is a challenge because these household codes put the father in charge, it put the mother beneath him in authority, and then the children, and then the slaves or the servants. Now, when it comes to slavery, we have passages where Paul says slaves are equal to freed people, and we have other verses where he says slaves obey your masters. And so in the context of this discussion of household codes, I reject the household codes of the first century. I don't think that there's a pecking order that men are better than women, but I acknowledge that that's in the Bible. Slavery is in here. We have Paul telling the servants to be obedient to their masters. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we've got to have wisdom to navigate these waters. And so with that, we are now going to go into the shortest epistle of Paul, to Philemon. This epistle is the shortest, and if you remember, we go from length, not from the date when they were written. So the longest epistle is Romans, and then they get smaller and smaller until we get to Philemon. Now you might be wondering, but wait, why is Hebrews so big? Because we don't know who wrote Hebrews. We'll talk about that when we get there, but that's one of the reasons why Hebrews is after Philemon, and it is longer. But this is the last official epistle of Paul, and it's the shortest one. So let's look at the epistle and talk about what counsel is given here. So the challenge here is that Paul has met a slave, an escaped slave, by the name of Onesimus. Now it appears that Onesimus left uh, Philemon's custody in a negative way. For example, verse 11, speaking of Onesimus, Paul writes to Philemon, which in time past was to the unprofitable. Or he even says in verse 18, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught. So the suggestion is that Onesimus stole from Philemon and escaped slavery and met up with Paul somewhere in Rome. Paul is sending him back to Philemon. Paul is sending him back. Verse 12, he says, whom I have sent again. So that's the puzzle here. Paul has met a slave who escaped slavery in a not-so-good way, and he's sending him back to slavery. So why would Paul send a slave back to slavery? Let me give you three reasons why he wouldn't. Obviously, one of them is the gospel's opposition to slavery. The Book of Mormon is filled with passages that it is not right that man should be in bondage to another man. So there's clearly one. Another one is listed in verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Paul loved Onesimus. He loved him. Number two, verse 13, whom I would have retained with me. Paul wanted to keep Onesimus in Rome with Paul. 
Number three, verse 18, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. So Paul loved him, wanted him to stay, and was willing to pay the debt. So why would Paul send him back to slavery? There's a powerful message here in that Paul now becomes a type of Christ in what he's pleading his brother Philemon to do. Seeing Paul as a type of Christ is really, I think, valuable here. Now, to really understand it, we kind of have to get into the context of, okay, what's at stake? First, know that if I'm a runaway slave in the first century Roman Empire and I'm stealing money to get my freedom, odds are I'm going to be put to death. A head of a household could legally execute his slaves. And so if a slave ran away and took money, then the odds are that he's going to be severely, severely punished, perhaps even killed. Now, Onesimus is going to travel all the way to Rome. Remember, Paul's in bonds. Look in verse 10, where we read, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. And in verse 1 and 9, Mike, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So this is probably a Roman letter, probably a prison letter. And Onesimus is probably leaving uh, Phrygia, which is in Anatolia or modern day Turkey. And so by my math, that's like 2000 kilometers. Now to get 2000 kilometers in the first century as a runaway slave, that probably would require a significant amount of money. So I'm just kind of putting things together here in my mind, but my guess is that he's probably also stolen money. And so death penalties on the line, he's clearly gone far, far away. And now he's being sent back sent back to the individual that has this power over him. Putting this together, Lane Johnson wrote this. This epistle is a special letter of intercession on behalf of the runaway slave Onesimus, who had fled his master Philemon and possibly taken some of his money or property. Ordinarily, under contemporary law, a runaway slave could be subject to frightful penalties. However, While in Rome, Onesimus is now converted to the gospel by Paul and have proved himself profitable. Therefore, when Tychius went to Coloss, bearing the epistle to the Colossians, Paul is going to send Onesimus along with an appeal to Philemon to receive him in the spirit of forgiveness as a faithful and beloved brother. That's Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. So you kind of got to read that in conjunction with this. Aside from the fact that it is a remarkable example of a tactful appeal, this epistle shows that the gospel of Jesus Christ is an equalizing force in the lives of men, regardless of differences in social status. Because Onesimus had come repentant into the gospel brotherhood, Philemon was asked to receive him, not as a servant, but as a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, I just want to acknowledge this, and Lane Johnson calls this out. Paul is not trying to subvert the Roman Empire's system of slavery, but he's also not advocating for it. This is what Lane Johnson writes. Because Paul has, in effect, delivered a slave back into servitude, some people have interpreted this epistle as an endorsement of slavery as a practice. On the other hand, Others have understood the request to receive Onesimus not as a servant, to be a disavowal of slavery. But Paul seems to have intended neither of these. He simply acknowledges slavery indirectly as a social reality, and at the same time is reminding Philemon of the obligations of brotherhood in the kingdom. I think Lane Johnson's dead on. I don't even think this is about slavery. I know that slavery is happening here, but I don't think that's the main thing. I think the main thing is Jesus. Look what he says. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. If we read this as Paul is a type of Christ and Onesimus is us, we can read it different. You see, I'm under penalty of death. I'm a long way from home, and I'm trying to perhaps even hide 
from the fact that, hey, I don't want to face the music. And I've done some stupid things. My goodness. And haven't we all? And yet, as I'm converted to Jesus, I now have to face it. And then look what he says in verse 12. Paul says, I've sent him again, and you're going to receive him. That is, mine own bowels. In other words, Onesimus is from my innermost parts. That's how I feel about him. Verse 16, not as a servant or a slave, but above a slave or a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. And then he says in verse 17, receive him as myself. I think that's one of the messages of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we take upon ourselves Christ as we take upon ourselves his name. The father receives us as if we are Jesus, not because we're great, but because he is. Verse 18, if he has wronged thee, Paul writes to Philemon, or if he owes you anything, and we all know that he does. There's no way you're going to go 2,000 kilometers from the location where you're being held in custody as a slave all the way to Rome, and then live in Rome long enough to find the gospel and find Paul. There's probably some some uh, money that he's taken. I'm just guessing here uh, because of the distances involved. Because of that, he says, if he's wronged thee or taken from thee, verse 18, he writes, put that on my account and I will repay it. That's verse 19. And in my estimation, I will never be able to repay the debt. This is the 10,000 talent God that we all believe in. I will never in all my life be able to pay back Jesus. And I love what King Benjamin says. If I were to serve him my whole life, yet I would be an unprofitable servant. I'm never going to be able to pay him back. But I can thank him. And in this case, Paul says in verse 19, I'm going to cover the cost. And that's what Jesus did. And I can imagine Paul probably paid a hefty bill to repay that. But it's nothing compared to the bill that Jesus was willing, gladly willing to pay to make us not a slave, but a brother, to make us all that he is. Boy, how we love Jesus. And boy, do we owe him a debt for the debt he paid in our behalf. So with that, we thank you for listening. Next week's Come Follow Me will be covering the first part of the book of Hebrews. And before we go, I just wanted to remind you that Bryce and I have been working on some new content on our YouTube channel that might be more relatable to some of our audience. These videos are more of an informal discussion. Now, Bryce and I will continue to release our podcast on YouTube and on podcast apps every week. So these new videos are just supplements to our podcasts and to your Come Follow Me study. So we hope that you'll check them out. We'll leave a link in the description. And with that, make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.